is Wednesday, May 20th, and we are doing our Bible class on Zoom once again. So forgive us if there's interference or it seems a little unnatural, but trust that the words come across because that's what matters, not how Rochelle looks or sounds, but the Word of God to be heard. And today's uh, subject is going to be on prayer. I've entitled it The Second Greatest Gift. Anyone know what the first greatest gift is? I don't see any volunteers. It's our salvation. The first and greatest gift is that God made the way for us to have a personal relationship with him. So that's number one. If he had done nothing else but save us, we say Dayenu, it would have been enough. But thankfully, he gives us more than that. And I believe that prayer is literally the second greatest gift. I think it's a gift too often overlooked or forgotten or set aside. The most unused gift that there is. And yet, it's so important. It's so critical that I want to draw your attention to it. And my prayer is that this will take you to a new level in your prayer life with the Lord. If it's a non-existent, that it becomes existing. And if it already is existing, that it takes you deeper and closer to our God. So let me um, go into a definition on prayer to start us. Prayer is a solemn request for help or an expression of thanks that's addressed to our God. Our God is a living God who hears prayer. So we can cry out and we can praise and thank. It is an act of worship, especially when we are thanking him, but even in our crying out because we're acknowledging that we are crying to one who is able to help us. Jewish way of thinking um, prayer is, they call it the service of the heart. And I like that, that it's a service of our heart. It's uh, supposed to be suffused with love and with reverence, but it's acknowledged in the, the Jewish world of, um, of, of, well, in the Judaistic world, I'll put it that way, as being a spiritual communion with God. And in that communion, they are taught that they should, um, they can request, make their supplications, but they should also have thanksgiving and adoration and even confession in their prayers. I think that sounds a lot like those who are believers in Messiah also believe about prayer, do we not? Simply put in our, um, in the books on, the Jewish books on prayer, simply put, and I love it, a conversation with God. And that is what it is. We often think of prayer as a formality. Fold your hands, close your eyes, bow your head, now say your prayer. Okay, not a thing wrong with that. But there's not a thing wrong with, forgive me, praying in the shower, <laughs> praying on the road, praying when you're pulling weeds in the garden, praying when you're doing anything. You should be in a conversation with God continually. If you ever saw Fiddler on the Roof, you saw Tabia talk to God all day long. He was the milkman, he'd be out on his, his deliveries, he'd be talking with God. That is what prayer is. It should not be set aside for just a specific time, although that's good too. It doesn't need that formality, but it's good to have that also. But we need to see the fullness of prayer in its many different avenues. How did prayer develop in Judaism? Well, originally, they were taught right from the beginning that it is a mitzvah. It's a good deed. It's something good to do, to pray. And originally, there wasn't specific texts or specific prayers or specific times. That all came along. But again, the, the, the expression from the beginning was to praise God, ask for your needs, then express your gratitude to God for all he's done. And this should be done collectively with others and individually on your own. When the temple was destroyed and the Jewish people were exiled back in Babylon, this is Daniel's time, Daniel's time, the majority of the people who came out of Babylon now knew less Hebrew. They still, if they were old enough, they knew some Hebrew, but it was also now mixed with Babylonian languages of the day, even called Babylonian, Persian, Greek was coming in, and there was much more mixing in. So the, the sages and the prophets of that day, and that's what they were called, I'm not saying the biblical prophets, but um, the prophets of that day who were supposed to be giving us the mind of God, they felt that 
curve now needed to be formulated so it not be lost because if you didn't have the Hebrew tongue, you wouldn't know how to pray. Well, we know God hears and understands prayer in any language, but the concern of that is what began to formulate prayer that you have in the formula of Judaism today. They started out with that you need to pray three times a day, and I believe they drew that from Daniel, that Daniel, that we saw that he opened up his window and prayed toward Jerusalem three times a day. On Shabbat and on holy days, they would pray four times a day. And they centered those prayers around uh, different words that, that are called the Amidah, and they had the Shema, and they had others. Let me just break it down. In English, it was centered around specific blessings that they would read, would um, quote again, God has blessed us with. It was also the Shema, that most holy prayer on their lips, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, and what they want to be the last thing they say on this earth, and that is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We've taken you through that study to see how he is a triunity one, that he is one that can be divided into the different personages of the triunity, the trinity of our God, so that we know him as Father, come through the Son, who shed his blood, that we might be sealed with the Spirit of God. Um, they added in psalms in their prayers, they added in different blessings, and by the second century, they pretty well had established what you see in Judaism today. Now, why did they have a synagogue? Remember, the temple is where the presence of God dwelt, and they would go to the temple, they'd make their sacrifices at the temple, and they would uh, worship at the temple, and then they would go back home. Uh, male Jews would come up three times a year if they did not live in Jerusalem. They had to be there three times a year to, to uh, adhere to the law that God had set down for them. Well, if you know that, that in Hebrew is called the Beit Knesset, that means a place of gathering. That's the idea behind the synagogue. It was a venue where when they couldn't get to the temple, especially like when they were in captivity in Babylon, they could come together and make it like a miniature replica of that holy temple or that, that uh, if you go back enough in your mind to the tabernacle, that it was the idea for them that God's presence dwelt there and they would meet him there. So they made a place where they could gather. They called it the synagogue or the Beit Knesset synagogue. Synagogue is the Greek word. Synagogue is our English out of it. And Beit Knesset is our Hebrew um, word. And it was decided that this was the, the place to come together, say their prayers together, and then it also developed into they could do deeds together and so much more developed out of it that would merit favor with God. Now we know God does, we don't earn his favor. He gives his favor, as we say, by grace, which is what we don't deserve. He gives us mercy, well, grace is giving us, okay, mercy is giving us what we don't deserve, Grace is giving is not giving us what we, I can't say it now. <laughs> I think you all know that. One is not giving us what we deserve, and the other is giving us what we don't deserve. There we go. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is not giving us what we do deserve. And uh, this was, you know, thoughts that were incorporated in the Jewish mind and passed down today so that a religious Jewish person values prayer even to this day does believe that it is a communion with God and that they should start um, with prayer, start their day with prayer, pray during the day, pray alone, pray together, and pray with these different avenues that I had in mind. So it really our background of prayer in Judaism is very rich, very good, very right on target. And they did say even with their formal prayers, it was not to exclude the free prayers where you just open your heart to God and express prayer. Where did they get these ideas? Again, we see the scriptural basis. Let me just list several quickly. You can look them up on your own later. But Psalm 39 and verse 12 says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Psalm 39, 12. The psalmist, David mainly, but others who wrote some psalms too, knew to cry out to the Lord, asking, Hear me, hear my cry. And then we find with the Talmudim in uh, Yeshua Jesus' day when he was walking on this earth, Luke 11 and verse 1 is quoted as saying, Lord, teach us to pray. And that was said by his Talmudim. In Acts 1.14, which is right after 
our Lord ascended back into heaven after he'd been here and lived his time on earth, died, raised from the dead, went to the Father, came back down, was seen with the people 40 days later, went up into heaven. Right after that, we read in verse 14, they all, meaning those who were followers of Yeshua, his immediate followers, they all joined together constantly in prayer. I think that's a strong key for what we should be like today. It should be constant. And in Ephesians 6.18, God's raised up Shaul Paul now, and Paul's carrying the, the message on, and he tells the group in Ephesus, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. I think that covers everything. Prayer should cover everything. And again, he told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray continually. Or as you may be more accustomed to reading it in the King James, pray without ceasing. How do you pray constantly? Does that mean that you can't do anything but pray? How can you get anything done? Well, I draw you to Tevye again. You do your work, and as you do your work, you pray. You constantly just keep that avenue of communication open with the Lord. These are the informal heart prayers, not the time when you're setting aside. That's good too. So that internally in Scripture we see these messages to us in prayer. To cry out, to ask the Lord even teach us how to pray, to join together with others in prayer, to pray alone, to pray constantly, all kinds of requests and all kinds of prayers, which means praises. Externally, we have sayings that we like, and they're a cute way to remember or hold on, but they also, they make a point. A day hymned with prayer is less likely to unravel. Prayer should be the key in the morning and the lock at night. Life is fragile. Handle with prayer. And when life is tough, pray. When life is great, pray. And when life gets too hard to stand, kneel. K-N-E-E-L. Kneel. Pray in faith, believing, and your doubts will starve to death. And seven days without prayer makes one weak. W-E-A-K. Okay, cute little ways, but good messages coming out on them. Let me tell you what prayer is not. Prayer is not magic. It is not that we have a magic formula, that we can use magic words, that God is a genie, that we rub the bottle in prayer, and poof, out comes God, and he gives us everything that we request. No. Are we allowed to request? Of course. He said repeatedly to ask. That is open for us, to ask and bring anything to him, but it's not to demand from God. Requesting and, and demanding are two different things. And I know some feel that they can demand from God, and I believe you can remind God of His promises, and that you're standing on them, and your expectation is for Him to meet you there. But I think there's a point of respect, and no more than a four-year-old child stomping his foot and saying, I demand that candy, should we be in an attitude like that toward our God. It is not also the information avenue between us and the Lord. You don't need to make him aware of the situation. Tell him, okay, Lord, this is what's going on, as if you're informing him so he can catch up and know what to do. Realize and recognize he knows the situation, knows it better than you, and he's not asking you to spell it out to him, but he does want you to ask him to come into your circumstances or to bring you into his conformity, that he might be able to meet you in that prayer. And he will in a way that will bring you the answer or the victory or whatever is needed as you are uh, conforming. So instead of informing, try conforming. And prayer is not a guarantee against suffering. I think sometimes we forget that. We think that, you know, because we've got this, this great God, He's on our side, we can talk to Him at any time, that we shouldn't have uh, trials and tribulations and sufferings, that, that something must be wrong. Well, if that's true, then why did our Lord Himself say in Yochanan, John 16, 33, These things have I spoken to you so that in me you may have 
peace. You may have shalom. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Do we have tribulation in our world today? Anyone dealing with the coronavirus? <laughs> you are whether you like it or not. You don't have to know someone to be dealing with it, but you're dealing with it in the very fact that you're on a Zoom camera watching this class instead of sitting in a room together, being able to hug and interact and be one-on-one one -on -one in, in a, a classroom or a group in a classroom. So, excuse me, we are dealing with it. We're dealing with the uncertainty of the future. How many times on the news, they're going to open this up. Oh, now they're not. They're going to do this. No, now they're not. It's going to end here. Oh, now it's not. If we look to the information highway down here, we're going to crash and burn people. <laughs> but if we keep that eye up to the one who knows. By the way, don't be afraid of the future. He's already there. And the he, I mean, is God. So knowing he already knows, knowing he's already there, knowing he's already got a plan for you that fits what you're going to walk through, then again, you're not informing him, you're conforming to him when you come in prayer asking and abiding that his words can be in you. That's what prayer is. Prayer is an active communication between our heart and God's ear. He hears, he answers. We feel, we hear, we cry, we have a need, we send out SOS, send up the smoke signals. We'll remember the incense, the altar of incense, the smoke that came up. That's our SOS. You can, you can send out an SOS. It's a smoke incense of prayer. And the Lord says in Revelation that the prayers of the saints came up a sweet-smelling savor in his nostrils. Why? Because he so loves you, he loves to hear from you. When you have a loved one that's apart from you, isn't it a thrill to get a phone call, to have some sort of communication? Well, that's how God feels. Do you sometimes stop and think about that? Is he missing you? If you haven't shown up for a time of interaction, he may be missing you. I guarantee you'll be missing him <laughs> and need to come back into that. And in that conversation, again, we humbly communicate. We worship him, and we sincerely seek his face. We should have an attitude that's showing constant dependency on God. In fact, that's very Jewish that we recognize that we're dependent on our God, that he alone is the one who's able to help us. Psalm 121 I look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The God who created this entire universe is at our beck and call, not to be a genie in a bottle, but to hear our cries and to speak to our hearts an answer that will enable us to continue on another moment, maybe, or another hour, or another day or to rejoice and enjoy in a fuller way the blessing that has come our way. We are quick to cry out. Are we quick to bless God, to thank Him for the blessings we're receiving? We are always free to cry, but we're always free to praise too, and we should be full of praise. And I will tell you that praise, or, or as one said, gratitude is an attitude that will give you altitude. Praise will lift you above your circumstances. It will bring you into the arena where praise is going on constantly. I almost said 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, but there's no hours and days in heaven. It's outside of space and time, and we know that. But the praise is continually. Every time we get a glimpse in the throne room, remember, it's not quiet up there, people. Do you remember how noisy we discovered it was in the book of Revelation? That... The angels are praising, and the elders are praising, and the people that we hear of are praising, and the groups that are coming in, those who have been martyred, are praising. Every group is praising. And someone once shared a part of their vision of heaven that God had given them, and they said that they would hear a resounding, like off in the, the distance, so to speak, you know, way not, not where they knew exactly who and where, but they'd hear a hallelujah and it would reverberate throughout heaven. 
It's like it echoed. As soon as a hallelujah shot up here, it, this heart over here responded with a hallelujah. And this one responded. And it was just hallelujahs all over heaven. And I think how wonderful to be in the midst of those praises. It makes our heart, or at least my heart right now, want to shout out and join in a hallelujah. And if you're feeling that way, send up a hallelujah. That's your prayer and your praise. And I see it. I see it in the faces. Yes, hallelujah. And remember, hallelujah means praise. Hallelujah to God. Yah. Hallelujah. Praise to our God. And that should continually be on our lips. What's the face of prayer? If we put a face onto prayer, we can take those letters, F-A-C-E. The first F, prayer is free. This is our greatest gift, and it costs nothing. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to formalize it in some way. It is free. Free 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Free. It is, A, always available. You ever try to get a hold of somebody and you get that constant busy, nee, 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 or you put on hold, wait for the next available operator, or you're sent down different channels and you get drop-down menus to the point that you're blue in the face by the time you get a human being on the other end of the phone, and then chances are good at someone from another country with an accent that you're going to struggle to understand. That never happens in prayer. It's straight, a straight line into the presence of our Lord. And we can always understand Him. We may not understand everything He's saying, but it's clear. And He will make what He's saying to us clear to us also. So in that sense, with it being free and always available, then it should be C, continual, constant. We should always be in a matter of prayer. And if we are with that right heart attitude, then it's going to be E, effective. Remember James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Or, as our New American says it, it can accomplish much. How are we righteous? By our actions? No. We know that we're righteous by putting on His robe of righteousness, which He dresses us in when we become His. We know that when we're seen in heaven, we're seen robed in His righteousness. That's how we're, we're a righteous person is by the very act of our Lord Jesus, His sacrifice of Himself for us, and His resurrection in um, abundant living that gives that to us. That's how we're effective and how it becomes a powerful prayer in the blood of Yeshua, in Him, not in us, but in Him. Let me give you some examples of biblical uh, prayers and we see what, you know, we can learn from those examples. Let me start with Eliyahu, Elijah. This one was a prophet and we see that he prayed, Lord God, let there be no rain. And there was no rain for three and a half years. That's called drought, people. That's called power. When the Rains of heaven are stopped for three and a half years. And then he prayed again and prayed for it to rain. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he stayed faithful in it and he turned his, his head away from everything in the world and just into his, his zone, I'll say, with God. And he kept praying faithfully. Even when he sent his servant to go look and he didn't see anything and he didn't see anything. But then he saw one little cloud like the fist of a man. And before you knew it, the land was drenched in rain. They couldn't get home fast enough. That's powerful. Eliyahu raised the dead through the power of prayer. Hmm, that's a lot of power. Daniel, Daniel, remember he's man of purpose, prophet, and prayer. And we see that he interpreted dreams by prayer. How did he know the dream of the king? By prayer. We see that he prayed for his people and interceded for his people. Lord God, it's time for our people to go home. 
He called God out on that promise in a respectful way. I'm taking your word, God, and I'm expecting your action because you give it to me in your word. I'm claiming it and I'm looking to it. And God heard and answered his prayer. Let's go back a little further all the way to Abraham. He is an old man <laughs> being given a promise of a son. And he, at 75, is praying for his son. He doesn't get that son until he's 100 years old. But he prayed for his son, and he was given his son. He prayed for the city that he needed to know where to go, and God directed him. We know that he sent out his servant, Eliezer, to find a wife for his son. And Eliezer, just a mere servant, now we're not talking a prophet, we're not talking one of the patriarchs, we're talking just a lowly servant. Prayed. Specific prayer. God heard him and answered it so fast that it said the prayer wasn't finished in his mouth. I love those kind of answers, don't we all? <laughs> and notice it was on a servant level. Does that encourage you and I today? It's not just kings and prophets. God hears the cry of a servant. We have the prayer of a religious leader by the name of Cornelius. And God sends a Jewish boy into his Gentile home. Through a vision, he had to give him and work on him, but brings him in that Cornelius and his entire family would be reached for the Lord. God heard the prayer of a religious leader that did not know how to have that personal relationship that came to find out because of prayer. He answers the prayers of kings. How many times in the Psalms did David cry out to our God? He cried out for blessing. He cried out to be rescued. He cried out for direction. I think he, you could almost find a prayer from David for whatever we're facing in our life and see. And David rode the, the roller coaster, the ups and the downs. He didn't stay up here and everything was perfect. He lived in the valley, people. And he had mountaintop experiences like we do, but he had valley experiences too. Even, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know you are with me. How did he know that? Because he had a relationship in prayer with his God. Is it only for the righteous people? Well, let me bring you to the thief on the cross. That thief cried out to the Lord, asked, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was saying, I know who you are, and I know this isn't the end for you. And the Lord met him and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. We see even a thief, when he turns his heart fully to his God, the other thief did not. But this thief did, and the Lord heard him and answered him. When you look through scripture, you'll see t a tax collector. <clears throat> you'll see women, where women are put down. You'll see a judge. I think every walk of life, fishermen, every walk of life, it is all inclusive. Prayer, it, there's, nobody has the corner of the market on prayer and excludes anyone else. Always know that prayer is available to you, even if you are coming, God forbid, but from a rebellious point where you're the prodigal son returning to the father. Remember the father was looking for his son to come back. I love that story. He was out looking and watching and waiting and hoping. And when he saw his son, he didn't turn his back on his son and say, you blew it, you're going to get what you deserve. Instead, he wrapped his arms around him and he welcomed him home. So always know no matter whether you're coming from a point of I've been in sin and I need confession or whether you're coming in a good place, God's ear is open. Yeshia felt so unworthy, Isaiah, that in chapter 6 and verse 5 he said, Woe is me of unclean lips. He said, I'm not, my lips aren't even clean enough to pray, Lord. He felt so unworthy, so unholy. We can feel that way also. And yes, we should not have an exalted uh, feeling for ourselves, but we should realize that the Lord is not looking for the exalted righteous who have no need. He is there to be, therefore, the one who is in need, and he's always ready to answer. I'm going to look up on my laptop. Oh, good, it is working. Luke 18, 10 to 14. Luke chapter 18, 
and we'll start with verse 10. A little bit slow, and I have a little bit of trouble because my mouse is out of space. I gotta scroll down. I may have to give this up. Okay, there's my mouse. <laughs> Sorry, folks. This is where Zoom is not my friend. There we go. Come on, a little lower. Okay, I can't get it to scroll down. I can't get it to scroll. Okay. <laughs> Good teacher comes prepared. <laughs> Sorry, right, folks. You close the book up. Hmm? You close the book up. Oh, okay. He's telling me I can close it, that and put it on top. I could have probably done my phone faster, too, but I thought the laptop was going to work. Luke 18 and verse 10. Okay, verse 9 tells us it's a parable. There's two men here that are going to pray. One is a Pharisee. Pharisee is a very righteous person, says his prayers all the time, tries to live adhering to every rule, every standard God has, and he goes up to pray. The other one is a tax collector. Tax collectors were looked down on. They were looked like our IRS people are looked at today. You cheaters, and we don't like you, and you make our life miserable, and et cetera, et cetera. So the Pharisee is standing before God and says, God, I thank you. I'm not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector stood afar off. He wouldn't even lift up his face, his eyes to heaven, but he smote on his breast and he said, God, be <clears throat> merciful to me, the sinner. Well, verse 14 tells us what the Lord hears and responds to. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. You don't need to have everything right in your act, all good and, and look wonderful on the outside. You need to have the heart right and that rapport, that relationship, that you can come to the Lord and say, I'm coming as a sinner in need of my Savior. I'm coming in reverence and in humbleness, and I'm asking you to abide by your promises that you say you will hear me. God told a sinful children of Israel, if you will humble yourselves and pray. I want to, you know, I'm going to leave out a phrase. I always leave out one phrase, and I don't want to do that. Second Chronicles 7.14 and we know it well because we, we quote it a lot. It was to the children of Israel originally. The principle is there for us and for our nation also. Uh, but this nation that had a, a track record of not being right with their God, getting right, forgetting God, and going back into uh, a punishment for that. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's a wonderful open promise. If we'll humble ourselves and pray, we can apply that for ourselves. We should be lifting up in adoration to the one that we are praying to. First Chronicles, if you looked at second, you can just back right up to First Chronicles 29, the end of the first book of Chronicles. 29 and verse 11, and in 29 11 we read, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty, for all that is heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, thou art exalted as a head above all. That's our adoration. O Lord God, you are above it all. You are, what did it say? You are great, you are powerful. All glory to you, the victory is you, it's your majesty, everything heaven and earth magnifies you, your holy name. That's the adoration we want to have. That's what we saw in Revelation 4 also, where they are falling on their faces, the elders who are representing us, and crying out, worthy are you to receive honor and glory and praise forever and ever. We should not be afraid to confess, because we are even told to confess. Ephesians 4.32 tells us that he is kind, tender-hearted, willing to forgive the one who comes to him. So don't let anything hold you back. And then open yourself up 
to give him all your supplications and pleadings are how it's put in scripture. Supplication is pouring your heart out. That's those heart agony prayers where maybe you're sobbing it out and you can't even put it into words. That God hears that heart. He knows that heart. He answers that heart. And he tells us in Philippians one of the great promises to us in that prayer. It's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. First of all, he tells us, come to him in prayer, but he says, don't be anxious for anything. Notice the key word in there, anything. Or in this case, mine says, be anxious for nothing. That means that I can be anxious because this virus is something we haven't heard before, so it doesn't fit in that category, right? <laughs> Wrong. No matter what you put into that, nothing is nothing. There is no reason ever for anxiety. That's a hard one for us because our human flesh wants to be anxious. 365 scriptures tell us not to fear. Why so many times? God knew we need a new one every day to be reminded. Not to be anxious, not to fear, but in everything. Again, if nothing's all-inclusive, everything is also all-inclusive. In everything, by prayer and supplication and crying your heart out with that thanksgiving. Thank you, God, you're hearing me. Thank you, God, I can cry it to you. Thank you, God, you have answers. Thank you, God, you have ways. Let your requests be made known. And when you come into that fellowship, when you've got that face on prayer, then verse 7 is what you'll know. And the shalom of God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding. That means you can't even comprehend how you get this peace. And my dad used to say he'd add in an all misunderstanding. How many times we misunderstand because we look with physical eyes instead of seeing in the spirit what the Lord's way and his will and his purpose is. But even whether we understand or not, uh, it's, it says that he shall keep your heart and your mind through Messiah Yeshua, through Christ Jesus. Notice he keeps the heart and the mind. The mind is where you're thinking. The heart is where you're feeling. He keeps you in your emotions. He keeps you in your intellect. He keeps you mind, body, soul, and spirit. And when we take that into Yeshua, Isaiah 26, 3, we know that that tells us he will keep him in perfect peace. Shalom, shalom. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. If you are really trusting in this God, then you will have perfect peace. His love casts out all fear. It can't stay. Fear and love can't coexist within you. If you are moving in his love, if you are keeping your mind focused on him through the power of his strength to do it in you, then you will have that shalom. We're told to ask. It's not that you don't ask. We're told to come crying. That means he knows you're going to be hurting or anxious, but you don't stay there. You move from the anxiety and the fear and anxiousness into that place of shalom. And you need to pray in faith, believing this is where I want to take us quickly. Um, we won't look at all the details. In fact, I'll just tell you, look it up and read it for yourself later. It's Acts 12, verses 1 to 17. This was approximately 44 AD. This is the first group of believers, that what's called the early church. This is not long after the Lord has ascended into heaven. And you have that Peter is in prison. James has been executed, and Peter's on the block next. And the church family, his little nucleus family, his called out assembly, have gotten together to pray about Peter's situation. And they're praying all night. <laughs> and if you remember the story, I love it. The angel comes and lets keep it out of jail. He's, he's chained between guards. He's chained in the inner chambers, and the chains fall off of him. The angel wakes him up, tells him, follow me. He goes out. Every gate automatically opens. He gets all the way out. He finds himself in the streets of Jerusalem free. And he knows that they're praying. He knows where they are. So he heads over for his believing family. And he knocks on the door. And, you know, it's the gate. It's not the, the door that we open the door and you come right in. It's the gate to the home. <laughs> they send their little servant girl Rhoda to the door. <laughs> She gets so excited that it's 
he's keeping, he's keeping, that she doesn't open the door and let him in. And mind you, he'd be a hunted man. She leaves him out there and she runs back and she tells everybody, it's Peter, it's Peter. Now, they're, they're in prayer. They're the called on assembly. They have a relationship with God. What should be their response? Hallelujah. God's heard and answered our prayers. Praise the Lord. He's out. Is that how they respond? <laughs> and you know the story as well as I. Oh, it must be his ghost. They must have killed him and it's his ghost. It, it can't be Peter. They tell her she's nuts. She goes back and goes back and forth. Finally, they bring him in and they realize and they rejoice. I get it, but I still have to say shame on them. They should have had more faith in their prayers because it's not in their prayer. It's in our God. And he is even able to take one out of the midst of chains in prison and release him in freedom if that's his will for the situation. So when you pray, don't be as that example was. Pray in faith believing. That's what pleases God. He says that if you don't have faith, you cannot please him. Do you want to please God? Then come in faith believing. That's the vitality of prayer. That's the the heartbeat of prayer is that faith and believing. And we develop this relationship over time. It's not something that's simple. It's not something that the way that you are in prayer today, you should be a month from now or a year from now. It's something that should be constantly bringing you closer and closer, conforming you more and more into his glory and bringing you more into that relationship with him that pleases him that places his character on us, that changes us. Remember, we're to be renewed by our minds being in him. And this is how it's done. How do we hear? How do we learn? How do we know? And how do we grow? By that communication, but also realizing he gave us a tool of communication. That tool, I love to call it his love letter to us. He gave us his word. He gave us promises. He gave us hope. He gave us examples. He gave us everything we need. I don't care what you face. The answer is in his love letter to you. Are you reading it? Are you reading it and putting it away? Or are you reading it daily? Are you into it continually? If you want to know him, you want to be closer to him, you need to know who he is, then you need to be into his word and you need to be into prayer. Prayer will make a difference in every situation because prayer changes people, it changes things, it changes situations. And I love to quote Billy Graham. He said to get nations back on their feet, and I think we're all praying for a couple of nations in particular to get back on their feet. To get nations back on their feet, we must first get on our knees. And I think that's an excellent thing for us to remember today. I, I, I'm, I say it often again and again and again, are you praying as much as you're complaining? If you're not, zip your lips and get on your knees. And remember how Billy Graham said, to get a nation back on their feet, we must first get on our knees. We can't run the world, but we can entrust it to our God. I think sometimes we forget that and we want to run the ship. We want to um, navigate. I can't think of the word I want. Whatever you do to a ship, you want to, you want to drive the car. Okay? Well, let's leave God in his position and let's be where we belong. But I am going to challenge you in relation when you think of the car. If you don't have a prayer life, you need to develop it now because prayer should not be your spare wheel. It should be your steering wheel. And if prayer is your steering wheel, if you have a relationship with God and you have a prayer life, does it need a tune-up or is it in good shape? You know, a car that, that needs a tune-up is going to miss. It's going to putter and it's not going to have power. If your prayer life is missing, puttering, or powerless, then you know you need a tune-up. You know that you need to be on your knees in the Word, remembering all these points from the examples given to us, 
that we might be conformed to his image, come into the power that is ours through the gift of prayer, that relationship that God has given us and why I call prayer the second greatest gift. I'm going to close, if I can, real quickly. I was going to close a little earlier. I'm, I know I'm running late. I'm, I think it'll be forgiven. But if I can find this real quickly, I want to... Um, let's see. Okay. I think it has to be in this chapter. I want to see if I can find real quick for you what happened for my mom on... Uh, oh, nope, I'm not. I'm in the wrong... Uh, on May 20th, 1953. If I had remembered the date, I would have looked this up ahead of time. But give me just a moment, and hopefully I can find it. Okay, I've got to be in the right area. Um, okay, that's after... I think I just found the end of it. Yeah, I think I'm right here in the end of it. Let me find where it starts. Yeah, I am. Okay. I'm trying to find where I can cut in here so I don't have to read too much for you. Um, let me tell you the background to it, and then I think I can just jump in here, okay? My mom knew that, that she was to go to Israel in 1953. God had put it on her heart, and she was set to go. She was finishing uh, Bible school in Los Angeles. Her home was in Sacramento. At that time, you had to get a um, visa stamped in your passport to go to the land of Israel, and you had to get a special request with the visa and she was going in as a student which was true she wouldn't want to go to Hebrew school and learn um, how to speak Hebrew so um, she needed to get a passport and then she needed to get that visa stamped in uh, in time okay and so um, let's see if I can jump in here um, okay well she'd gone to the the passport office she had applied for her passport and she asked them, you know, how long will it take to get my passport? In those days, you, it got sent away and came back. And the man told her, it takes anywhere from two to six weeks. And because Queen Elizabeth is her coronation, everybody's going to England, it'll probably take the six weeks. It's, it's usually taking the maximum amount of time. Well, she, in fact, I'm just going to tell you the story instead of trying to read it. She um, looked at the calendar and she realized if it took the six weeks, she would not have time to get the visa stamped in her passport in Los Angeles. She would have to be back home because the school year was ending. She'd have to leave by all ends. She'd have to go back home to Sacramento. And because of the distance, she'd have to start over again in the Sacramento arena for passports and visas, you know, and all of that. So she'd be starting from scratch. So she went to her knees in prayer. Lord, if this is of you, if I'm to do what I believe that I'm to do, let my passport um, request, you know, submission, go on the top of the stack to Washington, D.C., and all the way back again, and let it be in two weeks. She prayed that three days in a row. Let it go on the top of the stack all the way to Washington, D.C., and let it come back, and, and let it be in two weeks. The morning of the third day when she was praying that, she just felt such an assurance in her heart that the Lord said, okay, in two weeks. She looked at the calendar and she marked that date would be, and you got it, May 20th. And that's why I love this story to this day because it reminds me when I hear it. She got up the morning of May 20th and she's getting ready for school and she's all excited that believing her passport's going to be in her mailbox at school that day. Well, she went to her first class, and she couldn't wait. She knew more. the mail would be delivered several times during the day. So after that first class, she ran to her mailbox in between classes, opened it up, it was empty. Well, that's okay. There's another mail coming. So she goes back to another class, does the same thing again, runs and checks her mailbox with that anticipation, opens it up, and it's empty. She finally, they get all the way through the morning, and it's lunchtime, and as far as she knows, there is only one chance left for one more mail to come, and so far it's empty. And she went, headed for her room to go up to freshen herself up for her, to her afternoon classes, and as she was going up, in, she, she just prayed, Lord, you know, I just fully believe that you told me it was to be today. There's one mail left, Lord, you can get my passport in that mail today. And she got out of the elevator and went to her door 
and there was a note on her door, and the note said, there is a um, signed letter, you know, where you have to sign signature, in the office waiting for you. Well, she knew that had to be her passport. And she said, I couldn't wait for that pokey old elevator to take me down. She said, I flew down nine flights of stairs, burst into the office, and as they saw me, they handed me a letter, and she said, I looked in the corner, Washington, D.C. And it was her passport on the very day that God had promised her. Does God hear prayer? Does God answer prayer? Did that encourage her faith? Yes. God knew the trial she was coming up to next, that she would need this security and this assurance that he was in it to encourage her for the next step. Whatever need you have, ask, and the Lord will supply according to his riches in glory. I know I've preached, I'm sure, to the choir, but I hope that in a day and age when we can be so full of anxiety, and so unsure of what our future holds, just the insecurities that want to creep in, if you listen to the, the conspiracies out there, it can rock your boat and it can do nothing but put fear in your soul. Remember, our God is not the author of fear. He's not the author of confusion. And he is the one who has promised you shalom, shalom. If you stay in him, mind on him, open up that, greatest gift spend time in prayer with him and i guarantee you you will be encouraged you will be lifted higher you will be above your circumstances instead of trudging through or under this is what our god does and i'm going to ask roger if you can come back and step to the controls and he's not here i'd love to unmute you I'll tell you what, I will close in prayer, but I welcome your comments because I hope this has been faith-building for you. Um, and I'll also make one comment before y'all leave because some new ones have come in. But let's, let's close with our greatest, second greatest gift, shall we not? Oh Lord, our God, our God, my God, our hearts are full and we do shout our hallelujahs unto you. We do want to praise you. We do want to thank you. We do want to adore you creator of heaven and earth what do you need of man that you're mindful of him what do you need of a little mere speck called rochelle i know i'm not worthy of anything and yet you bless me with everything and i know that that i'm insignificant in a world of seven billion and yet you know the number of hairs on my head i know that you are the god who keeps the universe in order and yet you have time to look at me to hear my cry and answer me Lord, I know that you are hearing the cries of everyone in this class today and everyone who's hearing it at another time. And as we lift up our voices to you, Lord, we thank you that you hear our cries, that you know even before we cry what we're crying out, that you promise that you answer before we even ask, and that your answer is always right. Lord, thank you that prayer does bring us into your view, conforms us to your image, makes us more like you, that we are praying in your spirit, abiding in you so that you can fulfill our requests. Lord, thank you. This and so much more is a gift you've given to us in prayer. We thank you for our salvation, but we also thank you that you've given us a gift of prayer that lifts us higher than anything in this world and brings us that sweet, sweet intimacy with you. Lord, we long for that moment when we will see you face to face, but we thank you that in the meantime, spiritually, we see you face to face, free, available, constant, and effective, that you bring our, us right into your presence and hear and answer. So again and again and again, praise you, hallelujah, our God, our Savior, our intermediator, the lover of our souls, and the one who we love so. In precious name, Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, Roger is going to unmute.